Welcome to Nature Revisited, the podcast. For those of you who are new to the podcast, my name is Stefan Van Norden, and thank you for joining me. Today, we are featuring Leela Phillip and her book, Beaverland. But first, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Jamie and Nancy Horton for their generous support for Nature Revisited, without which Nature Revisited would not be possible. Thank you. Leela Phillip is an award-winning author and a Guggenheim Fellow. She also was awarded fellowships from both the National Endowment of the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Presently, Leela is a professor in the English department, teaching in the Environmental Studies program at the College of the Holy Cross. Leela joins me to share her passion for the subject of her latest book, The Beaver. So Leela, thank you for joining me today on Nature Revisited. It's a pleasure to have you on the podcast, talking about an animal that you have become very familiar with. You might even say obsessed with the beaver. When did you first become interested in this fascinating creature? First of all, thank you so much for having me on your show, which is terrific. And second, I think it's a badge of honor to have become obsessed with beavers. So I like that you say that. And it certainly did happen. So I have to confess, I discovered beavers by accident. I'm a writer and I was taking a walk with my dog in the woods one day and literally I heard this bang. I had no idea what was happening. I looked where my dog was looking because she usually would point out interesting things to me. There in what had previously been a kind of dry area in the woods was glinting silver with water and then another bang. I thought a gun had gone off. I was so startled. And then I saw this little brown head swimming back and forth. And sure enough, that was the beaver. I was just transfixed by the tenacity of this small animal. I think that was really the moment. But then I became hooked with watching the transformation of that site. Within about a week, they had taken down several trees and built a significant dam, which can happen in the east. They can build a woodland dam pretty quickly, and the water just began to spread. As soon as it started to spread, it began bringing wildlife, and the transformation of this area was incredible. It was like nothing I had ever seen. I thought I had sort of seen a lot, but I had never seen anything like this. So that was the beginning. So how have your ideas of wildness changed since discovering the beaver's at the pond near your home? That is a great question because beavers really changed the way I saw the world. So I start watching the beavers near my house. They become the anchor of my day is to go down and watch what the beavers are doing and then all the explosion of wildlife that comes to that place, which I now understand to be the power of beavers in transforming the land. They bring so much biodiversity with all the water they bring. I just had so many questions and one question led to another question. And so before I knew it, I was six years into researching everything I could find about beavers. Along the way, my ideas of wildness changed and really they started to change right from the beginning because my beavers, as I would call them, disappeared. I do eventually find them. I'm a writer by nature, but I'm a journalist by training. So when they disappeared, I reached out to people in my community. First, I spoke to a man of Nipmuc descent, and he said, oh, yeah, beavers had come to that spot on and off throughout his childhood living there. 
And if I wanted to know about them, I should talk to fur trappers. He had grown up hunting and trapping. He knew more about the native plants in that area than anyone. Incredibly knowledgeable about the woods. I was stunned. I thought fur trapping in rural Connecticut in 21st century? I couldn't believe it. But then I met Herb Sabansky, who I profile in the book. I soon discovered that I had a lot to learn from fur trappers, and I was tromping around in the swamp, in particular with Herb Sabansky, learning from him. To go back to how my ideas of wildness have changed, I think I needed to find the beauty of nature in places where humans weren't. And the problem with that in the world we live in now is that we have so altered the planet that if we keep chasing that idea and don't embrace our human altered world and our role as a species as part of what is happening, we can actually continue a lot of damage. And in an ironic way, completely paradoxical way, which was one of the reasons why I positioned Herb at the beginning of the book, it was Herb, it was this fur trapper who actually disrupted those ideas and got me thinking about that. He loved every inch of this completely human-damaged environment that he was tromping around in, in rural Connecticut. He wasn't kind of looking out west to, you know, grand, magnificent places for nature. He was finding it right in his own backyard. And it was actually from Herb that I got the title of the book because we were in the swamp one day and he looked around and he just said with so much joy in his voice, this is Beaverland. I just remember the love he had for the woods And that the trapping part was a very small part of what he was doing. So anyway, it really readjusted my thinking about a lot of things. I know there are many versions of the great beaver story. Can you share one of them and explain why the story is so important, not only to the beaver, but for all of us? I opened the book with the story of great beaver from my area. It's a deep time teaching story of the Algonquin peoples. And there are many versions of it. You know, once I decided that it was incredibly important for me to not just research the beaver from colonial times on, but to go before, I started discovering these stories and I realized that I really needed to spend some time there. First, I collected as many versions as I could from different areas and I found a lot of similarities So the great beaver story that I opened with is this story of a mischievous beaver who actually hoards water. He comes to the Connecticut Valley and he floods it, but it's too much and it threatens the humans. And so the creator has to actually discipline the beaver. As the story goes, the beaver is chased up and down the Atlantic seaboard and actually into the Great Lakes area. And there are versions of this up and down the Atlantic seaboard, into the Great Lakes, and up into Canada. The version in Connecticut is, on one hand, an origin story of the valley, but it's also a teaching story about the dangers of hoarding resources, because anyone listening knows that it's not the beaver who really is the problem. It's humans. It's the human propensity to take too much. I wanted to start Beaverland with one of the oldest stories on the continent, the story of Great Beaver. The subtitle of your book is How One Weird Rodent Made America. Just how weird are beavers, and what was their connection to the making of America? Another great question. What's not weird about beavers? They're this kind of animal mishmash, which I think just fires the human imagination because they have this mammal head and face like a bear, and then they have these humanoid hands, and then five nimble fingers, and then they have these enormous goose-like kind feet. But of course, the paddle tail, which I have fun describing in the book as run over by a tractor tire, is the most interesting feature to me anyway. A couple things about the tail. It's a rudder when they swim. Scientists now believe that it is the density of blood vessels in the tail that actually enables the beaver to sense water pressure. Beavers are brilliant at building. They're the only animal apart from man who builds the habitat 
they need to survive, which is pretty incredible if you think about that. If you break a beaver dam or a beaver dam is broken, they don't have to see it or be close to it to know that there's a hole and the water is rushing out. They can feel the change in water pressure and they will rush over. The thinking is that the tail is a kind of water sensor. They store fat in that tail. During the winter, they go into torpor. They don't hibernate. That's just the animal itself. They're, they're sort of like a platypus, but they're not related to platypuses. They're this combination of, of animals we can recognize, I guess. But how beavers made America, they jump started the first economies here. It was the lust for their incredible fur, which Europeans had figured out could be released from the hide to make an incredibly durable pelt that was used in the hat making industry that initiated transatlantic trade. There's just not a lot of stories about how beaver made America. I guess Americans were a little uncomfortable about the fact that this little 36 inch rodent is responsible for so much. By the 19th century, fortunes have been made on the backs of the beaver. So John Jacob Astor, our first multimillionaire, gets his start trading pelts on the wharfs of Manhattan. As soon as he figures out how to do it, he establishes almost an international trade monopoly by establishing the westernmost settlement. He calls it, of course, Astoria, names it after himself. All of this is the beaver fur trade. But what he didn't realize, what everybody didn't realize, because they weren't thinking about resources as finite, they were thinking of them as commodities, the beaver ran out. By 1900, there are pretty much no more beavers. The other thing about beavers in North America is there's this great conservation comeback story that we really need to own and think about. People worked very hard to bring beavers back to the East. 1905, they were brought to New York State, Adirondack Park. 1914, to Connecticut. And because those beavers were brought back so intentionally, populations began to rebound in the regrowth of the forests after agriculture, you know, after farms were abandoned and people moved into cities. It's an incredible story of our country and our time. What is a beaver bundle and what is its significance? Anybody who's kind of interested in this should really read a wonderful book by Rosalind LaPierre called Invisible Reality, really about Blackfeet thinking, and she's an enrolled member of the Blackfeet Prod. As I have learned and as I have understood, the Beaver Bundle is its a library, but it's made up of songs and rituals and stories and objects that hold these things. It's like a physical library that holds these aspects of knowledge. And the knowledge is knowledge that was given to humans from the beavers via a human who went into the beaver world, into a beaver lodge, and brought that knowledge back to humans. This is why beavers are considered teachers and protectors. Beavers taught humans in Blackfeet thinking and cosmology about time, and they brought a profound understanding of the water ecology, just, just as a start. So that's what, what we mean when people refer to the beaver medicine bundle. The bundle is literally these objects that hold stories and teachings. If I may loop back, this also connects to something I wish I had said a minute ago, which is that it's not just that beavers made America the country that would come after the indigenous peoples. Going back, beavers shaped North America, the geology, the watersheds. They go into a river system and they build their damming complexes that bring so much water. You really need to think about beavers as part of a healthy river ecology and think about the river system of North America as a circulatory system, like a series of arteries and veins that pulse water throughout the land. We just don't see the river system like that in many places today because we harnessed water to build a country. We've used the river system for 
energy and transportation and for agriculture. We have so degraded the river system and destroyed so many of the wetlands. Beavers have this incredibly new role to play. This is, I think, also what's really exciting. Once they were pelts, but now they are really climate change allies. They bring wetlands that are huge sponges that can help absorb floodwaters. Here in the east, I think we're really waking up to the problems of a river system that really can't handle the water. It needs to be slowed down, managed, and allowed to sink back down into the aquifer. And that's the role that beavers play. What can beavers teach us how a healthy river ecosystem works and the myth of the free-flowing river? We have thought of rivers as free-flowing because we needed them that way for transportation. So we worked very hard to remove log jams out west, which a river naturally does to slow itself down. One of the myths about beavers is that they slow the water down and so it's bad for cold water fish like salmonids and trout. They have been seeing an incredible uptick in endangered Chinook and even bullhead trout coming right back. Those kinds of fish need stretches of fast-moving water, but they also need food. And the food is created in these slower areas. And the juvenile salmon also need slower pockets of water to grow in and feed before they hit the faster water. Otherwise, they just get rushed out. We're really just learning to rethink about what rivers before colonization should look like, more a river scape than a river. So what are some of the other myths about beavers that may not be true? A lot more coexistence can happen than people think. I think the default has been there are beavers, I need to trap them out. And one of the myths about beavers is because they're a rodent that they are just going to be able to repopulate and their reproductive rates are so high. In the East, it seems as if the population has not only leveled off, but increasingly there are areas where beavers have disappeared and there's really good beaver real estate and the beavers aren't coming back. There has been no population census. Nobody knows exactly how many beavers are around That's also a myth. They respond to pressures just like any other animal. And while they're highly adaptive, they're monogamous rodents. They will mate for life. So if they lose their mate, they'll live in a bachelorette state for the most part. Also, if food is scarce, they will have fewer kits. But another kind of fun myth about beavers that I think is important to dispel is people think that they have to keep cutting down trees to keep their ever-growing teeth under control because they have these amazingly sharp teeth that grow all the time that are responsible for their incredible ability to cut down even large trees. They just bite and spit out the chip like a little furry chainsaw. They actually self-grind them. So they will only cut down trees when they really need wood. Like any animal, they, they're not going to expel energy in a wasteful way. They can't afford to do that. That and the fact that this idea that beavers warm water and therefore are bad for fish is a really important myth to dispel. Gradually, groups like Trout Unlimited are realizing if we have some beaver wetlands, we actually have an uptick of trout. Duck hunters are also really becoming interested in having beaver wetlands because they, with the biodiversity, brings waterfowl. So a beaver pond can be a really very significant duck site, waterfowl site in short order. And that's happening in places like Maryland and the Chesapeake area. So you say that the beaver is a keystone species. What is a keystone species and how does the beaver fill that role? Another great question. So... A keystone species is a species that is so important that if you remove it, it's like removing the keystone arch brick from a medieval arch. The whole arch falls down. So if you take beavers out of the landscape, so many species are dependent on the hydrology 
of the beaver dam and the beaver damming complex. Think about what beavers do for a second. They'll, they'll come to a stream and they're doing it you know, right now as we speak without any human guidance or intervention. They're actually repairing our damaged river systems, which is, I think, something to underscore. You know, beavers just do what they do. They're part of a healthy river ecology. And if we can give them space and support to do what they do, they come to this stream or creek, they'll make a dam and swell the water. And that basin of water is really just the beginning. And I think this is something I really tried to share in Beaverland is the way in which they're just central to the health of the river network because they set in motion ecological, biological, hydrological processes. So the way they do that is that there's the water we can see, but then around a beaver pond is a sponge of water and soil. It's part of what's called the hyperreic zone of the river system, and it holds on average in the east three times as much water as the pond itself. So if you shut your eyes and imagine every little beaver pond you see as having a huge sponge around it under the ground holding three times as much water as you can see, the mass gets big very fast and the hydraulic function gets big really fast. It's also a web of ecological connectivity for microbial organisms and all kinds of chemical processes. And I write about this in the afterward. Underneath the river, there's there's really a shadow river, which we never see, which is all this water moving through the soil. It's the water we can't see, but it's vastly important. I'm watching a site right near my home now of two young beavers who fled a kind of desperate situation. They found a site on the stream system and they didn't dam up an existing stream. They went to what appeared to be like a dry area. I had walked across it a month earlier and my sneakers were dry. But within six weeks, it was full of water. So they enabled this subsurface water to come back up to the surface. They literally pulled a hidden section of the stream network up. When I looked at the topo maps and looked at aerial photographs that go back to 1934, I saw that sure enough, this was an area of the stream system that had gone intermittent, probably because it had been drained for agriculture and the, the stream had just been dried out and had gone under and the beavers had actually pulled it back up. So that's a big impact on the ecology. I think anybody who's been around a beaver pond experiences this. You hear the birds, you see the animals. It's just incredible, the transformation, the amount of life that comes. And that that's what I witnessed, you know, to go back to the beginning of the book. I just kept thinking to myself, what what is happening here? But I could feel something really big was happening that I had never witnessed before. And I think about it now, it, it was really a moment of, of awe, a moment where you're kind of shifted outside yourself and you realize you are witnessing something so much larger than yourself. I thought to myself, I really have to, I, I have to kind of try to understand this. So you can't talk about beavers without talking about Dorothy Richards. (laughs) I was, I really had a lot of fun. I met so many incredible people researching this book, people in the present and then people in the past. And so I was really interested to find out who in North America had written about beavers. So first I start with Lewis Henry Morgan and the American beaver in 1868. And then I work forward from there. And it's really interesting to discover that there were these pockets of people who fell for beavers, like I did, but then their writings kind of disappeared. Dorothy Richards, born at the end of the Gilded Era and raised in the Depression, Little Falls, New York, and she manages to to get a little farmhouse on the confluence of two streams, Southern Adirondack Park Service says, can we release two beavers into your creek? So they do. She starts watching them and then she is just so engrossed that she spends the rest of her life committed to studying them, 
by the time she dies, she has managed to collect enough money to put aside 600 acres and form the first beaver sanctuary. She has written about them and lectured about them and observed them, and she writes a book called Beaver Sprite. I recommend people read it. It's really interesting. She was very much a self-trained naturalist in the American tradition of that, really which starts with Henry David Thoreau, who was measuring the water of ponds in Concord. It's interesting now that climate scientists are actually going back to his measurements and using them. Nobody seemed to know anything about Dorothy Richards. She certainly wasn't cited anywhere. And in fact, her writings were pretty much disregarded and she was rather disrespected in her time as the crazy beaver lady. Not surprising, but it made me want to really learn about her. And sure enough, many of her observations about beavers that were discounted in her time, she was the one who said that beavers can reason much more than was previously thought, that they actually have pretty rich emotional lives. You know, she did get a little bit out there. She adopted two beavers. In 1938, the state allowed her to bring two beavers into her house and raise them. And she did it to study them. At one point, she was living with 14 beavers in what was really a very tiny house. Her contribution was significant. I think it's really interesting to think about someone like Dorothy Richards now because we're at a kind of forefront of new thinking, a revolution of thinking about animal psychology, the emotional lives of animals. We know that octopus dream. We understand so much more about inner lives of animals than we ever had before. And many of those things Dorothy Richards was writing about, and yet it was discounted in her times. It's part of why I was really committed to bringing her into the book. And Beaver Sprite exists now. Two people who were her kind of apprentices, Sharon and Owen Brown, they're doing wonderful work on behalf of beavers. They have an organization up there. What do you see as some of the things that we need to do to assure a healthy future for beavers? Oh, wow. So thank you. The kind of call to action. You know, I thought when I finished this book, I would sort of be done with beavers. I think in an interesting way, I realized that as the book has gone out, I have a role to play speaking about it. And it's interesting to talk to so many people because people do have that question, like what what is to be done? And I think the first thing is to learn about beavers. The second is to learn about what's going on in your communities. There may well be a highway department in your town that routinely traps out the beavers out of habit because they don't know about coexistence strategies. To help get them that kind of information, you'd be surprised how the default has tended to be, we've got to move the beavers without understanding that A, trapping them out doesn't always end up so well. And B, there might be a way to lower the water or move the path and have all the biodiversity and benefits. On a policy level, There's so much interesting work going on. In the Chesapeake, farmers can get water credits for leaving some land aside, basically, for beavers. We need more policies like that, beaver lease habitat programs in different states. On a more national level, just being alert as a voter. California is a really good example of this. So they mismanaged beavers for many years. And then in 2023, they just turned it around. So they are pretty much leading the nation now. They've actually started reseeding beavers back into the watershed for wildfire mitigation, for flood control. Washington has a similar bill. Oregon has a bill that passed. They have money in the state budget. Utah has a statewide beaver management program. Here in the Midwest and in the East, we need similar state-by-state programs to say, this animal can really help us with ecosystem services, and people need now policies to support the animals. So lastly, how has your studies of the beaver not only changed how you look at nature, but how you look at yourself? Oh, wow. That's another good question. Even when I started this book, 
you know, I was alert to things like the Anthropocene and and I knew we were in a bad state. What this book really taught me was that we can discover and learn from the power of the natural world right in our own backyard. And like many Americans, I think I was always sort of looking west for big nature stories. The design of the book is really intentional to stay in the east. It's actually circular. I start in the beaver pond and then I'm always circling back. I love books in which the way the story is told is actually part of the story. You know, beavers were so ordinary, they're extraordinary. The more I thought about it, the more I thought that was an important reset that I needed to make. I look at a swamp now and I see an incredibly rich place where life is happening. It's called the kidney of the river system for a reason. Water is being slowed down and cleansed. So I know the science now. So I see a lot of places that I ignored differently. I think more profoundly for me, beavers helped me realize that I needed to think in a more relational way. And I think this goes back to the great beaver story and even why I started the book with that, because we have awe-inspiring technologies under our belt. So as a species, we have that technological power, but we still are in this awkward phase where we don't know how to live on our planet sustainably. There's so much environmental degradation and all the issues of social injustice that go along with that. So what we really need is to just think differently about how we go through our day, how we live on this planet. And I think it's a small shift that leads to a bigger shift. If you even take a term like keystone species in indigenous ecological knowledge or science, they might use the term keystone relative. Once you say keystone relative, that implies not just what the beaver can do for us, but what we need to do for the beaver in return. And I think that kind of a shift is what's really needed in our thinking for us to prevail and face the challenges that are coming at us now with accelerating climate change. But I really think it's a shift we can make. When I started this book, I thought, oh, we need hope. But I think we need hope that leads to action. I think that's really the moment we are living in. I've been so gratified by the reception of Beaverland. The fact that it's been on the New York Times bestseller list means I think that people are hungry for stories that can lead them to finding hope and resiliency as we face our collective future. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Leela Phillip and that you get the opportunity to read her wonderful book, Beaverland, and that you visit her website, leelaphillip.com, to learn more about this fascinating animal. If you enjoyed this episode, please share with friends, family, and colleagues. If you would like to share your thoughts or comments on this or any other episode, please email me at nordenpro at gmail.com. That's Norden, N-O-O-R-D-E-N-P-R-O at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you. You can follow Nature Revisited on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and our website, nordenproductions.com. The music for Nature Revisited is Tim Buckley, Buzz and Fly. Nature Revisited is produced by Stefan Van Orden and Charles Gagan. And I hope you will join us for the next edition of Nature Revisited. And in the meantime, remember, we are nature.